Thank you so much, Dr. Betteridge. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, with you, and um, this talk will be a little bit different, maybe from uh, what you've seen in the uh, CMES uh, colloquia thus far. Um, I'm kind of an odd bird that way, and uh, you know, it'll make it interesting. Um, something I wanted to mention at the outset here is that, uh, as Dr. Betteridge mentioned, I've been an astronomer for uh, 30 years, and I've got some years on top of that too. So um, it's been a really fascinating project here because I know what the sky looks like. And those of you who have an interest in astronomy uh, may you know, agree with me. And so knowing what the actual sky looks like versus finding uh, you know, some pieces of um, uh, you know, star names or whatnot in poetry, it really helps bring the poetry alive and it helps bring those ancient star calendars alive. So a big part of this project is to reconstruct uh, this ancient view of the sky as best as we can. Uh, there's a lot of holes, there's a lot of uh, uh, liminal areas uh, where we don't know which way it might go, but as best we can, we're gonna reconstruct the sky and uh, you know, hopefully that will be uh, a new source of astronomical inspiration to you all. I'm gonna jump right in with a story about Suhail and Jeuzat. Now a long, long time ago, not in a galaxy far away, <laughs> but this galaxy, uh, there was a beautiful woman named Jeuzat and uh, there was this guy, Suhail. He lived across the river from Josette, and Suhail had two sisters. Uh, they were known together as Asharian. Well, Suhail, Josette, they got together, and uh, the time came for their wedding night. We don't know exactly what happened here, but something really bad happened, and on the night of their wedding, Josette died. Uh, some say uh, her back broke in coitus, which would be really rough. Um, we don't know what happened exactly. But Suhail feared for his life because of course uh, the family of Josette is gonna try to seek blood vengeance upon Suhail. Suhail flees to the south far, far away. Well, his two sisters, Sharian, um, do different things. One of them decides to follow after her brother, <coughs> Suhail, towards the south. The other sister stays back. Uh, she doesn't want to leave home. She cries and cries and cries. So this is an old, old legend. Uh, we don't know exactly how old it is. Uh, we can date uh, when it first appears in the literature, but it's probably tens of thousands of years old because a lot of this is actually what happened in the night sky. So here we have Zhao Zat, uh, which you might recognize today as the modern constellation of Orion, uh, particularly its belt. And this, the Milky Way, is the river. Now, Shera El Abur uh, is the sister who crossed the river. Abur means to cross. And this is the star we know today as Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. Now it's the brightest star partly because it's by nature you know, a bright star, but it's also rather close to us. And so over long, long periods of time, you can actually detect the motion of the star against the other stars behind it that are much further away and don't move near as much in comparison. And so, 50,000 years ago, <coughs> Shara Abor was on the other side of the Milky Way galaxy. Now, it doesn't mean that the legend started 50,000 years ago. Perhaps it started 25,000 years ago or, or something even sooner long enough to notice the motion of the star, which was once inside the river, 
and is now crossed the river and is on its banks. This is uh, the oldest legend I have found uh, dealing with the night sky. So as Dr. Bedridge mentioned, uh, the project I'm working on is called Two Deserts, One Sky. And I just, at this point, want to thank uh, the NASA uh, Space Grant Program and the Arizona Space Grant Consortium uh, for allowing me this opportunity to uh, take part in this research. And also uh, the School of Anthropology and the School of Middle Eastern and North African Studies uh, for the uh, joint funding in the research. I'm going to talk about three main sources that I use here. Um, there used to be quite a large number of books, um, and together they're called the Enwat genre. It's a genre of books that deals with uh, meteorology and the positions of stars and uh, how those positions were used to predict seasonal change. And in the desert, when you don't have much water, uh, you rely greatly on the rain, right? And the rain is the, the motivator that then causes all these other kinds of seasonal change, uh, plants, animal cycles. And so here, uh, we're gonna be using three main sources. Uh, Kutrub, who died in 821. Uh, his work is the oldest uh, complete work that we have and provide some really interesting insight into uh, some of these um, uh, constellations and asterisms as they were in the progress of change. And then Ibn Qutayba's work is the most uh, famous and complete uh, extant work that we have. It's very detailed, has many, many references to the poetry, and his task is uh, to prove that uh, the Arabs didn't need the Greeks for their sciences. And in this particular work, he's looking at astronomy, of course. And then uh, we'll look at, as well, the influence of a Sufi. Now, a Sufi was an astronomer, and he set out to uh, update the data from Ptolemy's Al Almagest, uh, written about 1,000 years before him, 800 years or so. And so, um, he's an astronomer, uh, and in the course of going through the night sky and looking at the different star magnitudes, the brightnesses in the sky, he also records data about the cultural beliefs about these particular stars. And something we'll see is a progression. As we go throughout time, the original, or, well, I'll get to that in just a moment. The, the complexes that we see earliest end up changing. They become fragmented. Um, it's tempting to say the word indigenous here. Uh, you know, it's unsure footing to do so. There are a lot of star names that we're gonna look at that appear to be indigenous among the Arabs, um, but we don't know what influences they may have had that we just don't know about. We do know certain influences came from Babylonian astronomy, and I'll mark that out as we go along and note that. Then, after, uh, after the advent of Islam, there was a great translation movement that begun. And that translation movement uh, had texts from India being translated, uh, including astronomical texts, and then texts from the Greeks being translated. And so during the Abbasid period of Islam, you have this great amount of uh, translation work going on, and you have uh, the mixture of scientists from different parts of the world. Now among some, there was um, backlash against this. Uh, they wanted to preserve the Arab sciences and not allow the foreign sciences to come in. And we're gonna see that uh, in the end, what happened is that the old celestial complexes become fragmented and chopped up as the new sciences are translated and brought in. Um, just a word here as well about transliteration. Um, in 
working on this project, the target is uh, the general public. And so I have simplified translations. Uh, so forgive me, uh, Dr. Gamal, you won't see uh, macrons and you know, doubled consonants and things like this. Uh, so it's here simplified. So uh, please forgive me that, uh, those of you who know Arabic transliteration. All right, and we're going through a, two different star calendars in parallel here. One is the calendar of Kusher, uh, which is a very old calendar of rain stars. They're significant because when they set, they herald, heralded the onset of rain or maybe the middle or end of a rain period. And then also we're gonna look at the calendar of lunar stations a little bit. Um, this here was adapted largely from translations of the Indian Nakshatra system, uh, their lunar stations. A lot of the stations are similar, some are a little bit different. Now, a word about the time of night. Uh, what we're doing in this project is we're following along with these star calendars. And if you want to genuinely follow along, um, you are going to be losing a little bit of sleep, I'm sorry to say, because the proper time of night to make these observations is called ghalas. It's the time of night when uh, the darkness of night is mixing with the white and the red uh, from the light of dawn in the tracks of the horizon. Generally, I found it to be about 40, 45 minutes or so before sunrise. Uh, it's pretty much the time when a star is setting and it disappears into the light of dawn just before it disappears below the horizon. So you can time these pretty well, but they will be slightly different depending on how bright the stars, stars are. All right, so we have a star field here, east and west. Uh, the stars change from night to night. There might be some stars you can recognize here. I'll give you a little bit of help. All right, these are just a handful of the several hundred star names uh, that exist in the night sky. Now, most of the star names that are internationally recognized today are of Arabic origin. However, most of those Arabic origin star names are, uh, do not predate uh, the translation of Greek astronomy. Most of those star names are actually Arabic translations of Greek sky pictures or Roman sky pictures. Uh, very few of them have actually survived intact. Uh, one of them, which we'll see later on, Aldebaran, is almost perfect. And uh, uh, we'll look at some of these as we go. So this is the website, uh, Two Deserts, One Sky. So we have a, a running uh, star calendar blog. Uh, I am a little bit behind on that because of my comprehensive exams, but now I'm done with those, so uh, we'll be catching up here. Uh, and then also as I enter each new blog entry, I'm taking the new stars and adding them into a continuously growing star catalog. So if you visit this site, and uh, I would love for you to do so, keep in mind that it's continuously growing and will evolve. Uh, we're gonna end up with probably 200 or so star names before we're done. All right, so here we go. Uh, the first complex is the well bucket. And we've got this great line of poetry from Adi bin Zaid. Fi kharifin saqahu no'un min adelwi tadalla wa lam tawari al araqi so during the autumnal season of fruit harvest, stars from the well bucket sent to him rain while they hung down low in the sky, the crossbars not yet concealed. We're gonna look at parts of this here. So this is the well bucket. Uh, those of you familiar with uh, astronomy today may recognize this as the square of Pegasus. Oh, I keep forgetting I have a pointer, sorry. The square of Pegasus here. For those of you not familiar with astronomy, uh, the little Greek letters are designations of the brightest stars in each constellation. Uh, we'll have a Greek letter designation. And then here, these are modern day star names. Now, this well bucket I love. Okay, this was the beginning and the end 
of the year. Okay? So here we have a picture of the bucket, the first part of it just about to set into the horizon. Um, these two stars together were the first crossbars um, or the first spout. So the crossbars are here and here. Now why is the bucket square shaped? Well, during these times, you would make a well bucket by taking a leather pouch, large leather pouch, and grabbing two sticks and crossing it in the opening of a pouch. Tie the intersection together with rope and connect that to uh, your well up above. So looking down from above, the bucket indeed has a square shape. So, and notice the articulation here. We have the crossbar rope in the middle, which goes up to the well rope. We have uh, the two crossbars. We have the sides of the bucket. Uh, there's really a lot of points of articulation here for this asterism. Now, this is very, very large in the sky. It's unmistakable. It's almost a perfect square uh, with very nearly uh, right angles. Now, uh, as you track the setting of this square, you will see that these two stars set first, these two stars set later, but not together. They each set individually. The time between these two stars setting in the morning is only about eight days. So in the earliest accounts of the star calendars, both the lunar stations and the rain stars, these two stars begin the new year. And these two stars end the previous year. So we have, and during that time, it would have been about uh, mid, late September. And so we have just a period of eight days in between the beginning of one year and the end of uh, the year previous to that. So it's a pretty good indicator of, of seasonal time. Now you'll notice, uh, those of you who are familiar with the Arabic, we have al Janib, uh, the side. We have, um, and here, al Faraz, that's really from uh, al Faras, the horse. So these are Arabic terms that are describing the Greek constellation of Pegasus, the winged horse. They actually have nothing to do with our bucket. What happened to the bucket? Well, when Greek astronomy was translated, there's a zodiacal constellation called Aquarius. And Aquarius is the water carrier, right? Or the water pourer. And the figure of Aquarius is often pictured uh, with a bucket pouring out water. So since we already had this name, Adelu, the well, the well bucket, they just used that name and applied it to the Greek constellation of Aquarius. So if you ask someone today, what is the Delu? They'll say it's Aquarius. But long before then, it was an actual well bucket in the sky. And the imagery is fantastic here. From the poetry that we read just moments ago, right at the beginning of the Wasmi rains, we have this giant celestial well bucket dumping water, literally, onto the earth. The Wasmi rains um, that this season begins right here with these two stars. Uh, Wasmi is named because this, the rain literally marks the ground. So the Arabic term, uh, the verb uh, yesim, uh, wasama in the past tense, means to mark. So the rains would mark the ground both in the color of foliage. Uh, you know, we know here in Tucson that once those monsoon rains hit, then we start seeing green pretty quickly. So that happens very quickly. And then they also literally mark the ground with the intensity with which they fall and hit the, the earth. All right, so the next asterism here is the great fish, al-hut. And the Arabic reads, hatta idha ma al-huti fi hawdin min adalwi kara. So until the time when the great fish put its mouth into a watering trough, by the well bucket and drank. Now we have connections back to the well bucket. Okay, so here's our well bucket. And here 
is the great fish. Okay, now this fish dates back to Persian times, uh, or sorry, to a Babylonian times. So it goes back to about 1000 uh, BCE. So it's about a 3000 year old fish looking pretty good for its age. At the mouth of the fish is the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, back in this time, uh, the Arabs did not mention the Andromeda galaxy uh, very much until we get to a Sufi. And he mentions it as a little spot at the mouth of the fish here. Uh, it has a belly and this star is a little bit of a reddish star. Uh, so it's the belly of the fish. We also have a smaller fish, okay? So we have a greater fish and a smaller fish, and the smaller fish also has a belly. Now, the fish story is a bigger tale. We've got a lot of fish in the sea. So here are the two fish we just saw with a well bucket. And just like the line of poetry mentioned, the great fish is by the well bucket. Um, here, in Babylonian times, this was the swallow, okay? And uh, so we have the swallow and the great fish. Those become truncated when we get to the Greek astronomy. So the modern constellation of Pisces is here, and it has itty bitty fish, you know, little minnows maybe, uh, versus the great fish that they once were. And then over here we have uh, yet another fish, the southern fish. And this bright star here, uh, today even, is known as Fomalhut, okay? From Fem Alhut, the mouth of the fish. Okay? So that's one of the star names that does survive through. Next, we'll go to the lamb. And this lamb we're gonna see is troublesome. Jada laha bidubli al wasmi. Min bakir al ashrati ashratiyun. Min athuraya in qadda al dalwiyun. So the marking rains, these are the wasmi rains again of autumn, watered the land copiously from the signs, the first seasonal rain that darted down from the Pleiades, or else a rain from the well bucket. And we're going to get to know Athuraya in a little bit here, uh, but Athuraya refers to the Pleiades star cluster. So again, we still have rain happening with the lamb. So let's look at this troublesome lamb. The lamb is al -hamo. Now you might recognize here the Greek constellation of Aries. Aries is a ram. Uh, this is a lamb, a little bit different, and it's a fat-tailed lamb, okay? Uh, the Pleiades star cluster forms the fatty tail of this lamb. And it's a, a beautiful picture because it's this dense cluster of stars that you can see with your naked eye, just like a fat little tail on the lamb. Now we have the belly of the lamb, and then we have um, the horns here. The horns here were also called the signs. Uh, it's a very old term. We don't know exactly what was going on here, uh, but they were significant, obviously, uh, by definition being the signs. But what happened was in the translation of Greek astronomy, the entire calendar that we're looking at shifted by two um, lunar stations. So here the signs are a lunar station, the belly is a lunar station, the Pleiades here is a lunar station. Um, and what happens is that Aries, long ago, was the point where the sun um, rested during the equinox, okay? And so that became very significant, right? So the first point of Aries, this is where the year starts, the solar year, okay? Now over time, this point changes. And by this time here, about uh, 600 or so AD, that point was already in Pisces, okay? But Aries still had great significance. And so a lot of the works that were being translated spoke of Aries and ultimately the entire calendar of lunar stations shifted to stations so that the year no longer started 
with the Wasmi rains, but it started with the setting of Aries. Okay? And that was one of the things that helped fragment the older celestial complexes. Now we have uh, two stars here, uh, the budding, uh, a nut, and the butter, a nut. Now these two stars uh, are especially troublesome. Uh, they're believed to have uh, qualities of bad luck okay, if they're setting. So we don't have a lot more information on that, but we just know that when these stars are recounted, it's always recounted that these are not very lucky stars. All right, and now we get to a Thuraya. Uh, Thuraya was also called a Nejim, okay, the asterism, the star par excellence. There's no star uh, more valued than Thuraya. So here the Arabic reads, Allah taraqat mayun hayuman bi dhikriha wa adayya thuraya junnahun fil maghrabi. And here, uh, Dhur Ruma is talking about uh, his beloved Maya. And he says, Won't Maya come at night to one amorously mystified by her mention when the hands of Thuraya reach for the western places of sunset? Now, previously, everything we've seen has been rather descriptive, right? So you have the shape of a well bucket in the sky and its different parts. You have um, uh, the fish, you know, the outline of the fish. This one, the Pleiades is anthropomorphized. So here we have the Pleiades, um, and in translation you might call it the little abundant one. Uh, Thoraya uh, is related to two different roots. It's most likely uh, coming from uh, Tharwa, uh, which is plenty, and so it's a diminutive, so it's, you know, the little plentiful one. Uh, but there's another root that is similar uh, that has connotations of moisture. And they're both very much applicable because when Thoraya is setting, um, there's the continuation of the Wasmi rains. Uh, and actually, we can see the great fish down here. Uh, the well bucket is not much further down, a little bit over here. So really, as the entirety of the hands of the Pleiades are setting, it's covering much of this whole Wasmi season. So lots of rain, very fortuitous star. Now we have these hands that reach far across the sky. Uh, modern day constellations here are Cassiopeia, Perseus, and going into Cetus. So very large constellation and very well articulated, okay? So we have uh, the elbow, we have the wrist, we have uh, the collarbone or the shoulder blade. Uh, sometimes it's called the collarbone. Uh, we have the tip of the elbow and the little pit of the elbow, all these different points well articulated on this one hand. Now this is the henna dyed hand. Towards the end of this hand, we have a star, um, Kef. And this star is a yellowish orange star. And so it's a henna dyed hand from the, the orange stain of the henna that's on the hand. The other hand here is the amputated hand because it's not as long. Um, interestingly, there's a very famous star cluster here. It's, it's actually two star clusters that are very close together. And it's called the double cluster. You can see it with your naked eye. And for uh, the Arabs of this time, this was the tattoo on the wrist. So um, very descriptive. And Thuraya is followed by Aldebaran, the follower. There is also star lore about uh, Thuraya and Aldebaran. And another star that would be off uh, up here known as Al Ayuk. So here we have another story of uh, love gone wrong, uh, another tra uh, tragedy, where uh, Aldebaran was uh, engaged to Thoraya and Aryuk prevented them from getting together. And so Aldebaran always follows Thoraya but never gets together with her. And so 
that other star, Ayuk, is called the preventer. Okay. And now we have uh, another very well-known constellation in the sky, al Josat. Asarat alayhi min al-Jawza'i sariyatun. Tujzi al-Shamalu alayhi jamad al-Baradi. So there came to him by night a pillar of cloud from Josat. The north wind drove frozen hail gently upon him. Okay. So we're getting into colder times, right? You might recognize this as the modern day constellation of Orion. Uh, we've in fact seen Josat uh, in the beginning of the talk with that very, very old story. And we have the two Sha'ariyan right here. The one who crossed the river and Rumeysat is one of those wonderful Arabic words that means the little blurry eyed one with pus in her eyes uh, because she was crying so much for the loss of her brother. So hail, which would be way, way down there. Now, unlike the Greek figure of Orion, El Josat uh, is a female. Okay? She has a bow, a bigger bow than Orion has. And this is her long hair. Again, there are many, many points of articulation here for the figure of El Josat. And we do have also some lunar stations. And this is where the trail of lunar stations gets a little bit fuzzy. Uh, these little three stars here is one station called El Haqqa, which is a, a horse's brand. And this pair of stars is known as El Han'a, uh, another kind of brand on a horse. Um, if I was going to look at this region of sky and pick out some stars to uh, mark the calendar, those probably aren't the ones I would choose. I, was, I would choose much brighter stars. Um, but this is what we have historically in the calendar of the lunar stations. Now, Al Josat, uh, the name is really, really old. Uh, in Arabic, we can connect it to uh, connotations of being in, in the middle of something. Um, I think in the earliest times, it actually referred to specifically the three stars of the belt, not the entire figure. And I think the rest of the figure developed over time. Now, we have uh, many different parts here. Uh, again, the hair, we've got two footstools uh, for El Josat. And many of these star names actually survive to today. So Rigel, uh, as we would say today, is Rigel. Okay? It's the foot of Josette. This star, um, Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse, there's probably 10 different ways of pronouncing this in modern times, has a very interesting story. Originally, this star was Yed el Josette. Okay? So the hand or the arm of Josette, and it's the hand that holds the bow. Well, in Arabic, uh, the difference between a Y and a B is one dot. And sometimes in transcription, you make mistakes. So uh, in medieval uh, European times, as uh, these figures were being translated into Latin, the Y became a B. And so we ended up with um, Betelgeuse. Uh, Josat got mixed up a little bit. The Hamza on the end got dropped and some things happen. We get Betelgeuse, uh, which becomes something like the armpit of Josat. You know, not as nice a thing. In modern times, we again have another transformation where in some Arabic astronomy books, I'm seeing Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse being translated as Beit el Kaus, okay? the house of the bow, okay? which again makes sense, but it wasn't what it was originally. So it's very interesting that we have an originally Arabic term here, gets translated into Latin, and then back the other way into Arabic in a very different form. All right, so this is El Josat. 
All right, then we'll get to the lion. And this here is a preview. Uh, this is where we are right now in our seasonality. The lion is um, really a magnificent constellation. When you look at it in the night sky, uh, either early night or end of the night, and the entire lion is up, it covers almost the whole sky. It is that large. Here, whoops, we have the Greek lion, uh, which you might know as Leo. Uh, there's also usually some legs that pop down just a little bit here, but that's pretty much the Greek lion. You can see over here, El Josat, uh, the two uh, Shara sisters, okay? And then over here is Aldebaran, the one who follows the Pleiades. Now the Arab lion, is a lot larger. Okay. In modern times, this is a constellation of Gemini, uh, Canis Minor, going back into uh, Virgo, Bootes. So the Arab lion has claws that extend all the way through Gemini here. The, these are the claws. And then this is the other arm extending to, this star here is also a Shara, El Humesat, that star that uh, stayed behind. And then the nose goes up to uh, this little constellation. It's a faint constellation uh, called Cancer. It's one of the signs of the zodiac that we know of today. It has a little star cluster in it um, that's faint, and those are seen as the whiskers on the nose. And then as you go back, uh, we have the legs extending back to uh, Arcturus and Spica. And then its tail goes up here. And there's a rather large, faintish star cluster called a Coma Berenices that forms the puff of um, fur on the end of the lion's tail. So here, uh, and in fact, this asterism is so large that in the poetry, it's often referred to in the plural. So you know, this happened when the lions were setting, al Assad. So very large constellation, very different from uh, the Greek constellations. All right, so this is a little bit of a preview here into where we're heading. As I said, this project is a work in progress. And so as we go on, we'll get some uh, built into uh, the lion and we'll go all the way through the lion. After the lion, things get um, a little bit less defined. We have a series of asterisms um, that all have a pattern. It's um, uh, sod, which is uh, the fortune or luck of something. And there's 10 of these different ast asterisms, usually pairs of stars, uh, where it's you know the luck of rain or the luck of lux, uh, different sorts of things like that. And then we end up right back to the well bucket. All right, so thank you very much for your time, and I hope you learned something new about the night sky.